Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Professor Irma Ilo from the Department of Educational Psychology at the University of Pretoria. And it is for me a wonderful honor to be facilitating this session, this Q&A session on the future of education today. This is a session that is open to literally everyone um, in the world who wishes to pose um, some questions to our esteemed panelists this afternoon. Um, as we zoom in under the umbrella of our discussion on the future of work, but what does this specifically mean for education? So I want to encourage you, you will see on your screens that there's a, a functionality where you can use the Q&A session uh, or, or functionality. We, I'd like to encourage you to please use that um, with all the questions that come to mind during the course of our discussion today and so that you can directly interact with the, with the panelists. The questions will be fed to me and I will be um, taking as many questions as possible um, during the course of our session. Okay, so our first question is, what defines a good education? And maybe I want to ask Eva to tell us in your mind, what is good education? You can unmute, thanks Eva. That's a very big question indeed to start with. What is good education? Um, I'll, I'll have a go at it. Um, so good education, uh, you can define it from different perspectives, from an individual's perspective. You know, what does it add to you as a person, to your personal growth and your personal aspirations? Good education is how it adds value to society. And society, I would say, not simply economic value, quite often we focus on that, but value in a much broader sense, um, that that would be good education. Good education, I spoke earlier about an educated mind, mm -hmm. is education that um, provides you an ability to think creatively, think in, a, in, in different ways. I just need to share something in here quickly with you. My mm -hmm. university, University is named after Sir Walter Murdoch and in 1926 he wrote something really profound that I think is so true now and he wrote, said something like the only education out of which good can come is education that teaches you to think for yourself rather than swallow whatever the fashion of the moment prescribes. So if you think about that that's good education, in my view. It's an ability for you to be that creative uh, person in the world. So when we talk about future work and good education attached to the future work, for the future work, we don't know truly what the jobs of the future are. We talk a lot about that. So to be prepared for that as, a, as an educated person is something to do with the words of Sir Walter Murdoch. In other words, that you are able to look at world in different ways. So that's a sort of a definition of a good education for me. And then I was sort of thinking about this from a parent perspective, because I'm a parent as well. And my daughter's been to university and studied anthropology and economics. And I was thinking, what did I want as a parent? What's good education for my child? Again, it's an education that sets her up in the world in a way in which she will find her way and she will be able to manage and she will be able to live a good, a high integrity life and she will add value to the society that she's part of. So there's a few definitions of good education. Thank you so much. That's very inspiring, Eva. And um, Brian, do you have any thoughts to share from your side on what a good education entails? Well, I think Eva has definitely covered off on the main bits. I guess I would just very succinctly uh, from a student's perspective, and I think what a parent would want, is that a good edu education empowers someone to be able to essentially do, to, as I say, to interact and change the world the way they want to. Uh, and I do think Eva has right, there is a social side, which is for society, we want education to do that and also make sure that they're good citizens of our society, very broadly framed. Okay, so that brings me actually to our next question. And again, we can, uh, I'm directing this at Eva. So should universities be offering specific training programs 
that prepare students for, for the world of work? Or should universities focus rather on, on education more broadly? So it's important to make sure that we provide through scholarships, the, people, uh, the ability for people who don't have appropriate things to get that equipment. And there's quite inexpensive ways to do it. Uh, you know, not everyone needs to have a top of the line um, brand new lap laptop. They need to have a laptop that connects to the internet. You need to have probably some sort of phone these days that connects to the internet as well. And so I'm, for example, looking at new ways for people to authenticate onto our network. That is how you, instead of using passwords, and people are gonna to need to have a smartphone. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's pretty clear to me that I may have to provide a smartphone for some of our groups because that's, that's part of access. And in the same way saying, if you couldn't afford books in the past, you don't get to come to university. Well, that's true in the distant past, but I don't think that would have been the approach we were taking 25 years ago. And we have mm -hmm. to accept that this essentially has every book ever written on it, and is a much cheaper and efficient way of actually uh, exchanging information. And so we just need to make sure everyone has access to it. Okay. Eva. Yes, thank you. I, I'm just thinking what might I be able to add. Um, just maybe reflecting a little bit in the, on the pandemic. And we had a lockdown here in Western Australia for two months. And, uh, you know, it was sudden as, as these things always are last year. And um, we, we had to really reflect on whether everybody has access to a digital device, i.e. can have an online learning, uh, whether they have enough data, whether they actually have enough funds to get the data to be able to learn. And, and also, um, we, we sort of um, were very con uh, determined to keep our library and IT labs open for those who actually did not have access or could not study at home because with the mm -hmm. pandemic also there is the context of your home environment mm -hmm. and not all home environments are conducive to study so access mm -hmm. to it equipment in the library plus a, a, a different safer study space mm -hmm. so when we then realized that the lockdown happened and many of our students at murdoch university are dependent on part-time jobs so many of them lost their jobs because of the lockdown, you know, they would be in service industries. We realized that they wouldn't be able to perhaps have the data, for instance. So we put together an $8.5 million package, support package for our students. And it wasn't just the, it was hardship package more, more, more broadly, but it had also devices, access to devices, and also it had data packages. So all, every student was able to have a data package. Um, so that we were comfortable for their learning. You know, curative information, which you can get the information online, but you have someone with expertise, experience, and knowledge to curate it in a certain way, which then makes you think in a certain way or raises questions in your mind. So, you know, that will always, I hope, will be there. Um, the blended learning, you know, I wanted to share something with you. I um, I set up the first blended learning unit in the United Kingdom in 2005, which some federal government funding, it was five million pounds. So it's a, I've been on a long journey on blended learning. And uh, so I'm a great fan of it because I think it's a fit for purpose. You know, certain things are well done in a blended context, but you have to do it well. Because, you know, we are all such consumers of digital content now that bad content or purely cu poorly curated content and so on is no longer going to do it. Yeah. So the customer, the student is actually much more demanding um, in the digital um, um, arena than previously. So that's so it has to be good quality, which then means, of course, that we need to have the skills in our workforce and experts who are able to enable that to be good quality. So blended learning, yes. Fit classrooms, yes. Lecture has its place, but you can also do equally good things online. It's 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 about partly about effort. But one other thing that I just want to quickly say was about the accessibility. And you know, in the earlier session, and Brian, when Brian did his sort of mini mini uh, talk, um, he talked about the 
sort of threshold for access, but also you, Brian, talked about the fact that, you know, educate, massification of education, I personally believe is a good thing. I know not everybody does. And I also believe that it really is for all who can benefit. So accessibility through online, you know, in places of the world where there are no universities uh, and not easy access is absolutely critical. And that's why online is critical. At the moment, as you know, in Australia, we have very hard borders. So we have no international students coming to Australia. I wanted to share this with you that we actually have quite a lot of enrollments of international students online. Wow. And the, the enrollment is there with the view to the students hoping to come to Australia at some point to study on campus. And we are sort of really trying to enable that. And then one final point I want to pay, make about is the campus environment. Absolutely critical, but what we're looking on campuses now are informal learning spaces, spaces where students can connect in a different way, not just classrooms, um, tiered uh, setups where you can actually have group, like a lecture format, but in groups and so on and so forth. Lots of um, digital technology around uh, people. So, but also the social connection. And you know, one of the, the, the sort of sad things about the two, only two month lockdown we had was how students could feel quite isolated and particularly those who were away from their home countries and were in a way stuck here. Um, so we actually, for instance, put a social program together, which was online and it was timetabled. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's a few thoughts. Thank you so much for that contribution, Eva. I would like to remind all uh, everyone who are locked into this, this session um, from all over the world, like Professor Kupe said this morning, um, more than 100 countries um, um, registered for this event. So I'd like to encourage everyone, the questions are uh, streaming in. I will refer, try to uh, capture some of them right now, but I'd like to um, encourage you to continue to use the Q&A function so that um, we can optimize this opportunity for this discussion on the future of education. Okay, so let me read this one. Um, through 2020 and 2021, students in developing countries and from lower income families have been impacted the most due to limited or no access to online education. What do you think should be the immediate action plan of governments, schools and industry to address these challenges. I think we did speak about it a little bit during this morning session, but I'd love for uh, the both of you to elaborate on this theme for students from lower income families. So I, I think this is a crisis and a crisis is a good chance to make some foundational changes. And so I think it would be a great time, for example, in South Africa, but in places around the world to, to take the opportunity to digitally connect the parts that remain disconnected. Because this is something that is gonna be critical for economic empowerment. Uh, because as you say, it starts with education. As Eva said, massification of education is great. As long as there's a way to connect people up mm -hmm. into different tiers afterwards. Uh, and so there, there is no substitute to taking the opportunity and connecting people. And I just don't think there is any other answer to that question than that, um, because nothing else is gonna work. Sure. Thank you, Brian. Plus, Eva. Eva has another solution, which is, you know, she may. Yeah. No, yeah. I don't think I have any other solution, Brian, but I did mention this morning um, the importance of um, the loan system in Australia and in the UK and how that has equalized education. And, um, you know, we had a, a sort of fear in the United Kingdom when the fees went up quite dramatically threefold, that that would impact on lower income families and families who might be debt averse. It didn't, so I'm really pleased to hear about, know about that now. It's been about 11, 10 years that that's been in place. So, so yes, everybody connected digitally, so online, but then does everybody have access to, because still to get a, a degree online, you need to pay for it. MOOCs are free. 
So I'm just thinking, I don't have a solution, but something needs to be so we can actually enable scholarships is probably one of those support from universities with online um, um, courses, maybe for the developing countries. We, we could have something, Brian, that would enable us to sort of support kind of free access to the credits because that's what costs money. Um, and um, also access to data. So you might have, uh, yeah. And Go Eva on. brought up a really important part, resources. So this loan program she talks about is invented uh, by Bruce Chapman here at ANU. It's called an income contingent loan, which means it's not really a loan, it's more insurance. Yes. So although you have a loan, you never have to pay it off unless you make money. Yeah. And so one of these loans that doesn't come back to stop your life, it doesn't bankrupt you. And so providing income contingent loans across the developing world, and that could be something the developed world did, might be a really good way to lower the costs, provide all the right incentives and jumpstart this. So that is actually a very good idea in beyond to enable what I talked about, which is paying for the infrastructure to connect people up. But that's a good way to do it. Yeah, I'm glad, Brian, we both came up with an idea. Okay, so our next question, we have about four minutes left for the rest of this panel. Our next question is around the preparation of high school students for tertiary education, for university of uh, life. What do you think are the most important things that for parents perhaps advise on how they can prepare their child for um, university when the, when the child is in high school at the moment? So I think, uh, and I'll be interested to see what Eva says on this coming from a Norwegian background, my US background being a little different, even though I grew up with a bunch of people of Norwegian heritage, it turns out. Um, <laughs> So I'm actually a minimalist. Look at Finland. Uh, you really need to know math and how to communicate in a language, English being uh, a real preference right now if you wanna be part of the globalized world. But the one thing that you just absolutely need to leave high school with is ability to do mathematics at a reasonable level and to be able to write, comprehend and listen. If you if you leave high school really good at those two things, life is actually uh, quite manageable. If you are missing either or both, it's bad. Beyond that, I always encourage parents to let their children love what they're doing, make sure they focus on those two things, but everything else is one of passion and love so that they see education as something that's fun and enjoyable rather than punishment. So that's my advice. Make sure you get the, the basics of those writing and reading and arithmetic, as we say in the United States, and uh, have fun otherwise. Sound advice. Thank you very much, Brian. So Eva, you will have the uh, final few words on this uh, during okay. this session. Um, just to let you know, Brian, I, I was educated in Finland. Um, but I do have Norwe Norwegian heritage. <laughs> so, so I just want to say that when people ask me, uh, and I do a lot of talks in schools and, and, and speak with parents, you know, what, what should a child do? I, I just say one thing, do what you're good at and what you have passion for. And interestingly, you know, because I, my, I, my daughter was brought up in England, but my, my family comes from Finland. And I was asking one of my nieces, a while ago, I said, what are you going to do, Emilia, when you finish school? And she was exceptionally gifted, um, a person. And she said, oh, I might be a school counselor. And I said, oh, aren't you gonna be a doctor? And I said, shame on Ava, because that's what she has a passion for. And that's what she wants to do. So I had become a little bit British in the years that I've been in Britain, because you know you are very much academically achieving to do certain things rather than do what you're good at or what you want to do and have a passion for. And, uh, but having said that, I'd agree with Brian, 
schools particularly have a challenge of having you know high quality stem subjects and teachers and so on and so forth and maths is critical and stem subjects but so are humanities that was my final word thank you very much to the both of you for this excellent session and all the wisdom that you've shared and thank you for everyone who participated